I think it's been three weeks since we spoke last, and uh, everything uh, in different parts of the world has been escalating since then. So there's plenty to talk about, but it seems to me that the most uh, uh, the the, the um, process that just can't be ignored at the moment is what's going on in Syria, and uh, it seems to me to I mean apart from all the um, um, tragedy of what's going on there, um, from the point of view of trying to understand globalization, it's a very good example of the. Uh, fact that no conflict is ever again going to be local. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. conflicts are global. Well, all, all conflicts are global, indeed. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the things that you always see from these uh, anonymously attributed uh, activist sources in Homs and in other places, after they give the body count, the next thing they give is the status of the, uh, the neighborhood's internet access. So that's obviously of great importance. But I, I can't help but thinking, one of, one of your earlier uh, discourses on this topic is that globalization eventually will butt up against the, uh, the national uh, authority of the state. And that's, that seems to be what we're seeing here. I mean, uh, Assad uh, is simply just not going to give up, even though he technically represents a, a fairly small portion of the population with the Alawites. And, they just seem to be so well entrenched at the top levels of government that there doesn't seem to be any way to overcome it. It's very difficult to um, look at these things dispassionately and try to understand, uh, irrespective of what the, diff the motivation of different parties might be, um, what might be the determining factors in what's going on. And it, it's reminded me of something that I often quote in uh, conversation, and having quoted it, I uh, feel embarrassed that I can't remember where I got it from, um, it, which is that 60 years of tyranny are better than one year of public disorder. Yes. And I was thinking of that today, and so I googled 60 years of tyranny, and immediately, of course, I got an answer. Who was it? Uh, and it, uh, But the answer was not the ultimate answer, but it's uh, a, an answer to keep us going, and it was that Noah Feldman had um, made it the title of a talk that he'd given somewhere, and he said that he got it from Ibn Taymiyyah in the 14th century, but that the way that it was uh, um, cited by Ibn Taymiyyah made it clear that it was had a much older origin, but we still don't know where it came, comes from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I mean, it, it is particularly interesting that in the Islamic world generally, which is after all the, the local context of this, um, there, uh, politics has always been a problem. Uh, the, uh, Khomeini is famous for having said, in Islam everything is politics. Um, when uh, the, the Prophet died, um, nobody quite knew how they were going to run the, the society, the civilization, mm -hmm. after he died because nobody could really replace him. And so they had to look around for existing models and decide which one they were going to follow. Uh, and then, of course, when Khomeini died, they had the same problem all over again. Um, there is no, uh, Islam has no political philosophy that helps them work out how to move from one leader to the next, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is to uh, have continuing legitimacy and leadership. And so that's one problem. Um, the fact that uh, they think that they have rationalized um, political authority, not by saying that it, it that it's legitimate or that it represents uh, um, final uh, divine authority in any way, because it doesn't. Uh, so they say that we, what we need is a public order so that everybody can go about their lives as good Muslims and not be a, and not give up their religious obligations through fear of insecurity. Right. Uh, so there's always this uh, underlying sentiment that you should put up with bad government because the the uh, if you disrupt it, the result may be worse. Well, it seems that uh, that underlying uh, feeling is being tested now, at least in Syria, and, and certainly if you look at this at the tail end, as the tail end of the Arab Spring it would seem pretty logical that that's exactly what's happening here. But what I, what I find most interesting is, is if you turn the telescope around a little bit 
and and look at the uh, the actions of the Chinese and the Russians in, in vetoing what they vetoed the Arab League resolution the other night. I mean, the reason they did that was, in my opinion, precisely because of globalization fears in the other direction. That, in fact, by acquiescing to that, it might open the uh, the path to Western military presence in the Middle East, directly in the Middle East, in Syria, which I don't know why that would present a problem to them, given what's uh, what's happened in Iraq. I mean, we got out of there as fast as we could, and now we're cutting back the uh, embassy presence size. Uh, but I guess that that's something they don't want uh, in the Middle East, uh, in the middle of the uh, the oil area, that, that, that big an American presence, I suppose. Everything you say is is uh, is absolutely correct, and uh, but represents the outsider's point of view, um, and uh, that may be the the best point of view. But we need to try to understand what's going on inside, and I think it's more complicated than actually gets represented in the news media. Um, the reason uh, Khomeini um, was able to foment revolution in 1978, um, even though uh, that would create public disorder, is that he said that the Shah had sold Islam to the West. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, an excuse for creating public disorder that trumped the general fear of public disorder. Um, now, I think that the fear of public disorder is one of the motivations that's going, that uh, underlies the um, uh, actions of Russia and China. Uh, Russia and China both have their own uh, national interests at stake. Russia has this um, uh, agreement with Syria to use its port on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, China is dependent on Middle Eastern oil. Uh, the last thing China wants is any sort of disruption that will interfere with the price of oil. Uh, so they both they both need public order, and the problem is that you've probably seen the uh, illustrations and the, the pictures in the media of people demonstrating in favour of Assad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, really quite large numbers of people. Now, yes. if that was in Iran, I would say, well, the government paid them to do it. Um, whether that's the case in Syria or not, I don't know because I'm not sure whether the government currently is capable of doing that sort mm. of thing. But anyway, even if they are paying for it, they still found people who are willing to take their money and, and uh, demonstrate in favor. Mm -hmm. And, and Syria is, is, um, the population is made up of a number of different communities and the largest community is the Sunni community that wants them out, wants him out. But there are a lot of other communities that are afraid of uh, democracy with the Sunnis in charge because on the one hand they feel that they may be then under the authority of Sunnis who would not have any sympathy with their particular variety of Islam or Christianity, mm -hmm. or their ethnic difference, uh, Kurds for example and Turkmen. Um, so that's one thing. But, but also... Um, they uh, are af afraid of reprisals. So there's, there's a lot to be said for um, a need to try to resolve the current situation without a, a total breakdown of order. Because if order does break down there, then the chances are that it's going to break down in at least half a dozen other states not very far away, all of them related to oil production and supply. Mm -hmm. How far away, uh, again, and I don't want to play the devil's advocate with you, but it, it's, it would seem to me from an outsider's perspective that uh, order uh, could be argued to have broken down already in Syria. I, I, I take it that your sense is that the Russians and Chinese obviously think it could break down much further and as a result don't and want it to erode. We've heard people say that it's already civil war. Yes. We've got to go in and stop it. But in fact, uh, it, it, it isn't um, outright civil war yet, mm -hmm. because the, uh, the government is still there. Mm -hmm. It's still got the armed forces, and most of the power is with the government. It's mm -hmm. just that the government can't get people to stop um, rebelling against them, but mm -hmm. it's still the superior power in the country. How much of the Russian and Chinese... Uh 
um, impetus is is motivated by forces, do you think, other than simply maintaining order in a, in a strategic geographic area of the world as much as it is uh, uh, in, in insisting that uh, this disorder, such as it is, not spread to their own countries? Uh, I don't know that they're worried about that, but there is another aspect to this, and that is that um, I don't know whether you've seen that The Economist has started talking about the Anglosphere, the Indosphere, and the Sinosphere. I've seen that. Uh, and um, this is where globalization comes in. I think that the Russians and the Chinese don't want the Anglosphere deciding what's going to happen in the Middle mm. East. Um, the, uh, the Indians are very quiet about it so far, but uh, you may have noticed that they've come to an agreement with Iran and uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan for a, pipe, a gas pipeline from Central Asia uh, to um, uh, um, secure their own energy supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're, they're busy um, working on their own interests. Uh, but uh, and and Russia, of course, is not dependent upon um, no, no. Middle Eastern oil at all. Uh, but does want to d doesn't want to be segregated uh, from the rest of the world by its geography, um, so that it, the uh, the West has its uh, can do what it's like what it likes, and so just mm -hmm. wants to hold on to this port in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the China is absolutely dependent upon. I forget now what percentage of, of Chinese energy supplies come from the Middle East. And it's not over fifty percent. It's well under fifty percent, I think. But nevertheless, it's a significant amount, and it would uh, cause China an enormous amount of trouble if the Middle Eastern oil supply were cut off. We'll so there are these individual interests, but nevertheless, uh, underlying all these individual interests, I think there is a definite feeling that disorder. Uh, can't be the best way to go about things. If we really, we've got to try to manage things so that uh, we can resolve these problems with the minimum amount of disorder. The problem is how do we do that collaboratively? Mm -hmm. And after all, what we did in Libya, um, it, you can't actually yet, at any rate, point at that and say that's what we should do because it was really successful. A lot of problems in Libya, and not quite clear how they're going to work out yet. No, I agree with that. So and what? what it's fairly self-contained. If the same sort of thing were to happen in Syria, it would be much more serious. Mm -hmm. What would you envision the next steps then for the the Anglosphere uh, to be with in regards to Syria? I think that uh, um, uh, Hillary Clinton should stop saying that the Russians are disgusting or whatever it was she said in yes, the got pretty Security strident. Council, uh, which is not... Susan Rice in particular lost her head. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not, not my idea of diplomatic language, mm -hmm. um, but um, it's true that the, the um, um, when before the Americans joined the international diplomacy and we all used to uh, conduct international diplomacy in French, they wouldn't have said it that way. No. But... Um, uh, I think that uh, there has they, it, it, America has to understand that now they have to work out ways to deal with problems like this with Russia and with China. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the Chinese, uh, um, the, the person who's probably going to be the next Chinese um, authority is coming to Washington today. Yes, he is. And mm -hmm. there's uh, a great deal of... Um, um, uh, a lot has been said in the last day or so leading up to that, mm -hmm. uh, and it would be interesting to see whether uh, the U.S. president and he can, in fact, finish up with a, 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 a all smiles at a news conference. He's, he's also going out to Iowa, um, I believe, over the weekend to visit uh, uh, the people with whom he stayed on a, a, oh. trade, a trade mission about 20 years ago. He stayed yes. in their house for three nights in a small yes. town. Yes, well, so maybe the Chinese have the right attitude, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, the, the, he, he could perhaps become uh, quite a force for change himself, actually. Uh-huh. So. But I think that, I mean, my feeling is that the Americans and the British, for that matter, um, I mean, the French and the other uh, Europeans are too preoccupied with the Euro to be doing very much about this, but the, the um, Americans and the British haven't yet 
quite got used to the idea that they've got to negotiate global solutions to uh, problems because all problems are now global problems and they can't control them. There does seem to be a, a little bit of unilateral military action that occurs too frequently. So I think we've uh, reached the time yes. again. All right, Professor, thank you. We'll look forward you to the week. next discussion. Thank you.